Hi, Raz. Hello, everyone. Hello, Vladimir <coughs> and others. How are you guys? Oh, we are fine. Thanks. How are you? I'm all right. Waking up. Nice to see you all again. It's... You have rather like San Francisco style psychedelic background. Oh, what have I done with my background this time? Sorry, I can't see myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> What's it, what does it look like? <laughs> uh, it's like some uh, acid green uh, bubbles. It's a lava yeah, lamp. From Jefferson's airplane from 1967. Or... More or less. Yeah, it's a <laughs> lava lamp. Uh, we actually, if you check out my lab website, you'll see that um, for the past two years, I've instituted a policy where every time a student wins a small cash prize, so like a poster award or something, um, they get to keep most of it, but they have to buy a lava lamp for the lab. And so now, now the lab is covered in like 10 lava lamps. <laughs> it's getting a little out of hand, but I'm kind of enjoying it. <laughs> well, let's wait another one or two minutes. Right, <clears throat> people are joining. Uh, well, before we start, uh, like a small announcement, uh, we have uh, a small change in the schedule. So in a week, the lecture, just one lecture, will be at uh, 7.15 p.m. Moscow time. So only one of them. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that, people. <laughs> no, no, that's that's fine. Uh, it's really difficult to plan so in advance and uh, not to make any changes. <laughs> All right. All right. So um, I think like more people will join us soon, but uh, I suggest to start. So today. Our lecturer is Russell Corbett-Detic from uh, the University of California in Santa Cruz, one of the biggest specialists nowadays in uh, uh, treating all these uh, millions of SARS-CoV-2 genomes. <laughs> all right, so Russ, you're very welcome. And we are looking forward to hear your lecture. Sure. Thank you so much, Vladimir. <coughs> And of course, thank you all for coming out and having me out here. Um, as Vladimir has said, I am now a expert in this, uh, which is a uh, another way of saying that I was not previously an expert in this stuff. And so I've only uh, very recently gotten into virology and, um, and phylogenetics, but it's been kind of a really interesting and uh, unusual time for me uh, to learn quite a lot of new stuff. Um, Vladimir, I think you're going to need to let me share my screen in order to uh, show you guys some slides and things I'm working on. Um, but I'll just fill more time in the meantime <laughs> talking about other things. So um, the, the other fun stuff we're working on these days, I mean, 
Honestly, not much. My whole research program has shifted to COVID. So hopefully you guys are excited about it. Uh, today, let's see, can I share my screen? Oh, I can now. Okay, thank you. Um, today, we go to here. That's my email, but what about this one? Okay. So um, and we'll go over to present. So today I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about kind of the background of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and the, the real goal of it is to uh, introduce the saga or the story of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 as told through genomics. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, functional genomics, a little bit about uh, what we're calling uh, genomic contact tracing, and then a little bit about the origins of the virus, things like this. Um, so it won't be too technical or too deep. And then uh, the next two, uh, so in a week and then a week from then, I'll tell you about uh, more about the algorithms and a little bit deeper into what we've done to be able to study SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Uh, and especially with the idea of, you know, how can we do phylogenetic inference? And then also, you know, uh, the, the reverse of that is when trees aren't trees and you want to learn about recombination and selection in SARS-CoV-2, what can you do? Uh, some of you here are probably already basically experts in this because you've been working on this stuff as well. So uh, maybe I'll tell you some things you already know today, but I think it'll still be kind of fun. So um, today, this is your outline of kind of uh, some of the main topics I'll go into. I've added some stuff and changed things, but basically uh, a little bit about where the virus came from. So an introduction to the virus genome and a little bit about how it works. So sort of the functional basis for this virus and, uh, and uh, not just SARS-CoV-2, but beta coronaviruses in general, how they, how they generally work. Um, a little bit about the stuff we've learned from it. So there's some things that are pretty clear very quickly for example, there are, are sort of unique and specific mutational profiles that we see in the virus population, which pretty strongly indicate uh, some human RNA editing defenses are affecting viral evolution, which I think is a tremendously interesting thing, uh, and evidence for this sort of a plus stranded effect, which I'll talk about. Um, using functional and comparative genomics, you can actually predict viral evolution a little bit in vitro, and I think uh, if you look back at these early papers from uh, basically from Tyler Starr and Jesse Bloom, you'll see that they, <laughs> they could basically predict a lot of the most important mutations that would arise and sweep through the viral population, which is a pretty incredible thing when you think about it, is that we were uh, kind of ahead of the game on that. Um, okay, and then uh, tell you a little bit about um, our work uh, tracing the spread of the virus around the world. So what real-time phylogenetics has looked like. I put it in quotes because uh, my basic opinion, not to, not to be too dismissive, but my basic opinion is the vast majority of phylogenetics platforms for this kind of thing haven't actually been real time or even all that close to real time. Um, but that's where we're going. And I think the future of this uh, can be summarized with the single sentence of everything needs to be faster. And that's what we've been working on. Um, and so a little bit of intro to variants of concern in the major clades of the virus. So in other words, just kind of the general background of how we got to today. If there's time, I'll do uh, a quick intro to genomic contact tracing, which is um, a little bit more specific kind of thing than, than just generally using virus genomes to study the virus and uh, with our tool Usher and the things related to Usher. So we built kind of a whole ecosystem of tools around Usher <coughs> in order to be able to use this and do uh, new and interesting things. Okay. So um, hopefully this timeline is not news to any of you. You've been alive for the past two years and have been paying attention, but just to briefly fill us back in on the earliest events. Um, so uh, the, actually this timeline is slightly out of date now. There's some new information that's come out, but it's still basically accurate, which is the first reported patient developed symptoms in Wuhan. So that's in December 8th of, of 2019, right? Um, and then, China alerts the WHO about several pneumonia cases, uh, you know, about three or four weeks later. At the time, they were calling it pneumonia because it was a respiratory virus. Uh, but I don't think, you know, um, and it may well have been developed that the COVID developed pneumonia in those patients. But I think the short version, unknown respiratory problem would be a fair way to describe it. Um, so shortly thereafter, there was an out, they discovered an outbreak was associated with a whole food seafood or a wholesale seafood market. They shut it down. Um, this, this thing got sequenced just a little while after that, and we had an idea what it actually was. 
Birth deaths are recorded uh, about a month after it was first uh, first patient, so here to January 11th. Uh, and then finally, you have some cases reported outside of China in Thailand, and then uh, very quickly thereafter, Italy and other places like that. Um, finally, January 23rd, we, we threw up a quarantine. Obviously, it would have been uh, nicer if we'd done that a little quicker, in my opinion, but here we are. Uh, and then, yeah, as early as January 29th, you know, 130 people had died, 6,000 new cases. And of course, today, uh, literally millions have died, and it's, it's spread throughout the world many times over. Okay, so that's your early timeline, what we're looking at. I'm just trying to remind you of what happened two years ago, and I know that it's hard to remember because uh, time in the pandemic is this bizarre thing that goes both extremely slowly, it feels like it drags on forever, and incredibly fast. And so I, uh, <laughs> I, I sometimes have trouble remembering how we got here, and I like to remind everyone at the very beginning of the talk. <laughs> okay, uh, just for your own reference, this is Wuhan on the map here. Um, I don't think that's particularly important other than to say it, uh, it's a really big city and it's a major uh, travel hub. And so the fact that the virus got out from there makes a lot of sense. Okay, so before we really get into SARS-CoV-2, there's some things that I, I typically like to remind people of. So um, this is not the first coronavirus outbreak in humans. Uh, so uh, there's actually been, there's at least two that have happened in our lifetimes. Uh, and I think probably more that we're, we're not even noticing. Uh, my basic opinion is that the zoonosis events, that's the event where a virus jumps from an animal vector population into humans is probably incredibly common. The vast majority of those are never even transmitted to one other human. And so we know very little about them. And then it's sort of these unique events like SARS-CoV-2 and, and the original SARS that are able to infect other humans and really spread quickly. Um, and just to remind you how those, those original two coronaviruses worked, uh, SARS-CoV emerged in about 2003 and it spread worldwide, right? So it did get around the world. Uh, it didn't really become a pandemic exactly in the sense that it wasn't that transmissible and it was able, we were able to control it pretty quickly. It is also a beta coronavirus. Uh, despite the name, it is not that closely related to SARS-CoV-2, uh, but viral diversity is really, really vast. They evolve super quickly. So it's, I think it's reasonable to say it's sort of closely related to SARS-CoV-2. Um, it, it does the same thing to get into human cells. It's entering through the ACE2 receptor. So, so uh, this clade of coronaviruses has the exact same entry mechanism from mammalian cells, which is there's a very specific uh, cell surface receptor called the ACE2 receptor. Um, which is sort of the main site of conflict between uh, a mammalian genome like ours and the SARS genome, which has uh, a specific protein, the spike protein, which is going to come up a whole bunch today and in the future, uh, uh, is, is this interlocking mechanism that the virus is able to use to kind of enter the genome. And we often call this sort of a lock and key mechanism, and I'll describe that more in a minute. So, um, <clears throat> this one probably transferred to humans from a civet. I had to look up what that is. It's this weasel looking animal over here. They're kind of cool looking. That's all I know about them. So we'll move on. Um, okay. The other is uh, MERS. Uh, and so this, I think was first observed in 2012, but I think there's evidence that it jumped uh, a few times into humans before that. Also beta coronavirus. Uh, it looks like it's almost always transferred, transferred from close contact between camels and humans. Uh, and it's, it's done this quite a few times. There's been a few hundred cases, uh, maybe more now, of, of MERS that we've observed in humans, uh, but it's very rarely transmitted among humans. So it doesn't have a lot of pandemic potential currently, uh, but certainly, of course, the, these things can change pretty quickly. And I think it's possible that, that other beta coronaviruses will have similar pandemic potential, even if not these exact two, or in the future evolution of these two they may. So um, it, the, this is a very long way of saying this wasn't a completely unprecedented event. Uh, and I, and uh, I think it would be fair to say that there are absolutely a ton of zoonosis events occurring kind of all the time, right? So um, it's kind of how viruses make their living in, in the long term is they're jumping quickly between host clades and lineages. Okay, so uh, my slides are a little cut off. Hopefully you can see most of this. Um, the, the very first thing that was done uh, was sequencing the, the viral genome. And the, the challenge here is that unlike now, when we know very clearly what the genome looks like and have primer sets that amplify it uh, you know, with pretty good specificity, 
Uh, that wasn't true then. And so what they did was non-targeted sequencing. You just take all of the RNA uh, in a given, I think this was a blood drop. It may not have been. Let's assume it's a blood drop from a human um, and you reverse transcribe that RNA uh, to cDNA and then you sequence that cDNA using a standard Illumina sequencer. Um, when you do that, uh, you obviously, the vast majority of the RNA in that human is from the human genome. And so you quickly subtract all the reads that map to the human genome. In other words, you align everything to the human genome, you pull out those reads. <clears throat> and then at the end, you're left with 1,000, uh, you know, about 1,600 total reads, of which quite a bit match SARS-CoV-1 just by blast searching or something like blast searching. And so um, what that basically tells you is we had a pretty good idea very quickly. This was some sort of beta coronavirus. Okay. Uh, and then they're just showing you the breakdown here of, of what this matched to. And the answer was SARS-CoV or a couple other viral genomes from various different things. So good idea that we've got something virus-like here. Um, and what they did with this uh, hopefully you're all familiar with it. I'll do this kind of quickly, uh, was, was try to assemble this. And so again, we don't know the genome in the first place. And so what you do is you use the raw reads themselves to try to figure out the larger structure. And so you're looking for overlaps among your reads. Uh, this isn't exactly how this is done. It wasn't an overlap layout consensus where they do an all by all comparison, but that's not important. Um, the important point is you find these chunks where these, where these reads map, you stick them together. You can do this kind of tiling across your viral genome. And you'll pretty quickly get the bulk of the genome assembled if you have pretty good coverage, right? Because you'll have many reads that overlap each other and you'll have these nice clean segments. Um, so that's your de novo assembly. You call these blue things down here contigs. That is to say that you've aligned this chunk of genome and you've kind of got this long stretch here that all goes together. Those of you that were here um, for last year, this is uh, they is not exactly how I described it last year, but it is a De Bruyne graph approach as we did describe. So in other words, you find these overlaps using uh, shared camers, which is little stretches of sequence that are shared exactly between two samples or two reads. And then you're able to extend this out and get yourself these longer uh, contiguous sections of the genome, which are conveniently called contigs. Um, okay, but as I said, this is an uh, this came from whole RNA and uh, the virus for various reasons is tricky to sequence that way really well. And so what they did after all this is use PCR to fill in the gaps. So in other words, we've got a pretty good idea how the layout of this genome looks because you already know what a coronavirus genome, how the gene structure of a coronavirus genome is laid out. They actually even kind of know where those gaps might be. And so they were able to design primers that sit here and here and able to amplify the section in the middle and Sanger sequence it to fill in these little regions. Um, Okay, and once all of that was done, we had something like this. So this is the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Um, uh, what I'm showing you is a pretty classic figure of SARS-CoV-2, which is this enveloped uh, virus here. And it's got you know a bunch of things going on. There's membrane proteins, et cetera. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about all those things. There's some features of the genome that are important and they'll be super important. Uh, later on in this, uh, in this series, so um, in next week and the week after, so I'll just point them out now. Uh, one that's gonna come up today and later is right here. This is the spike protein, so spike glycoprotein S. This is basically that key mechanism. So in other words, it's the way that this virus is interacting with ACE2 receptors. It's how it's getting into human cells, a tremendously important part of the virus genome, and it's sort of the main thing that all of us are staring at all the time to get some idea what's gonna happen to the virus next. Um, okay, if we go over from there, you see there's a bunch of tiny little genes. The other thing that's really important to point out about the structure of this genome is uh, it's structured in a way that the largest genes are at the front, and then you have many smaller genes here toward the three prime end of the genome, which is over this way. The whole thing is about 30,000 base pairs long, which is um, slightly long for some viruses, but very normal for a coronavirus as far as I understand. Uh, and it's kind of what we're looking for here. So this is this is the main thing. It's kind of, uh, once we had this structure, we were able to design um, Amplicon amplification schemes, uh, which is by far the most commonly used uh, mechanism for sequencing. And so it's tremendously important discovery. Very early on in this process that gave us sort of this, the fodder we needed, the ability to, to address these things in scale. Okay. Um, so, how does this genome work? So this is a little bit about the function of a beta coronavirus genome. So um, I am, again, I am not a virologist, so, so I'm going to give you my very, very simple understanding of how this works. 
Uh, find a virologist if you want to know the real details of this sort of thing, but I'll give you some idea. Um, these things here that are labeled TRS, that's transcription regulatory sequence A and B. Uh, there's L and B, right? All of these are B. Um, okay, this is a plus stranded virus, which pretty much means that if you read along this way, that will that will translate into a protein, right? In other words, left uh, left to right, five to three, that translates to a protein, uh, as is typical of eukaryotic uh, uh, translation, there's a poly A sequence here at the end of the protein for all of these things. Um, so this is kind of what SARS-CoV-2 is doing for translation. So it, it has a few things it's doing. One is uh, it produces all these subgenomic RNAs, and it does this via mechanisms I'll show you in a second, where it's splicing uh, these transcription regulatory sequences, uh, translation regulatory sequences onto these various sites. Um, and also, uh, uh, but also while it's doing this, while it's producing all these subgenomic uh, RNAs, which it can use to produce the various proteins, right? Each of these starts at one protein. So here's 3A, E, M, et cetera. They're all colored to match. While it's doing all of that, it also is doing continuous replication. And so the way it does that is uh, it, it'll start at the negative, <coughs> sorry, it'll start at the negative strand over here. Replication always goes five to three. So the five prime end of the negative strand, this is a positive strand would be here. And it goes back this way until you've got the whole genome replicated, right? And so after you do that, you've got a negative strand. Uh, and then of course you just go the other way again. So back from the left to the right to make another positive strand genome. So it is doing both of these things at once. It's creating subgenomic RNAs for translation and it's replicating itself all the time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So a little bit more about how transcription works in SARS-CoV-2. Um, what it's doing, uh, and, and the way we know this is a beautiful paper in Cell from Kim et al., but basically what they did was they looked for uh, reads that span junctions. So the way those subgenomic RNAs work is they really wanna get this uh, trans a translation regulatory sequence L uh, spliced onto each of these little protein products. And so what they do is they look through uh, all of these reads that span some junction. They look for those sites where this is particularly common. And if you kind of go out here to the edge, you'll see uh, a couple things I think are worth pointing out. But basically, um, this is a heat map. It's a little tricky to read, so I'll walk you through it. I apologize in advance. But uh, your three prime breakpoint position of the, <clears throat> of the uh, uh, junction spanning read is here. And then you also have the on the bottom here, your five prime breakpoint position. So think of this as a way of looking at your junctions just sort of spun on the side. Um, and what you're basically looking for, <clears throat> if you're looking for the structure of this genome is, and you're looking for this particular set of events here where the, this translation regulatory sequence L has been spliced into each of these sites is cases where there's a huge excess of that specific mo sequence motif um, that then has an immediate splice right onto each of these sites. And so you see these huge peaks, they're labeled little points at the top here like this, this set here, uh, all correspond, if you kind of follow it over to say here, they correspond to the front of each of these major proteins. Right? N goes up to here, goes over to that one, et cetera. This is uh, the spike right here. You can see that the, the, the spike, there's quite a lot, there's a huge excess of this uh, TRSL sequence and spike. So in other words, um, the, uh, there's quite a lot of processing going on to produce these proteins, but, the, but that's kind of the basic logic of how this thing works and why it's important. Again, this will come up later in the, cla in the class, the next couple of lectures, you know, so I'm, I'll hearken back to this at some point in the future. Uh, for now, just understand that the, um, each of these protein products is made uh, and importantly, as we're making each of those protein products, it, it, it implies something about the abundance of RNA in the genome. And so uh, this group also did this really cool experiment, the thing I'm more excited about here, where uh, what they're doing is, is they're looking at the, the amount of RNA at each uh, position in the genome. So it's the whole genome array this way. This is the abundance of reads kind of at the edge of the genome. So that's that leader sequence. As you might imagine, uh, it's very abundant because uh, it's very abundant because the um, uh, it's it's been spliced onto many subgenomic RNAs. Um, and of course, uh, you see this huge excess of RNAs back here, right? So this is nanopore data. It's direct RNA, so it, we think it's a reasonably good approximation for how common this stuff is. I don't know why 
it's a good approximation for how common these things are. Um, if you use Illumina data, which requires that you, re you reverse transcribe the cDNA first, you see it's a little bit uh, more jagged, uh, but the same basic effect is clearly apparent, which is that there's a whole huge excess of RNA at the back section of the genome. Uh, again, so consistent with this subgenomic RNAs and protein production starting at each of those sites, we would expect this kind of thing to happen um, because to transcribe you know, this protein, you've got to have stuff that starts right here. Of course, the molecule goes all the way to the end. And so there's, there's this stepwise function where there's always more going to the right across this genome. Um, hopefully that basically made sense. Again, this is going to come back up in, I think, various forms uh, throughout this, this uh, series. So I, I, want to, I want to try to make this as clear as possible how this is working and why there's this huge excess of, of subgenomic RNA particles toward the far side of the genome. Okay. So <coughs> the, the first thing we learned about SARS-CoV-2, um, this, this figure is actually a little out of date and I'll show you the updated version because more sampling has gone on. But um, the, the thing I like to point out from this is the first thing that we did with this genome sequence was compare it to all the other uh, coronavirus genomes First thing I would do is just blast it. I'm pretty sure that's what these people did also and find all of its closest relatives. So um, what we're showing you here is nucleotide identity. In other words, um, uh, the percent of sites in a given little window that are exactly identical between SARS-CoV-2 and each of these five, each of these five genomes down here. So SARS-CoV is in red. You can see it's actually not that closely related. It's something like uh, 70 something percent identical across the whole thing. And then of course that varies uh, very dramatically <laughs> with, with uh, distance along the genome. Um, there's also bat cove, a few other things, and they actually found this one up here, uh, which was at the time thought to be the most closely related relative that we had, and it probably was, um, which is rat G13. You've probably heard about this quite a few times by now. You can see that it is uh, fairly similar across the whole thing. Another thing that's really worthwhile to point out about this is um, there's a sort of striking pattern here where there's an enormous excess of uh, variation right here. And that, that dip in variation, right, or that dip in identity, uh, excess of variation, right, these are all more different in this region, is exactly corresponding to the spike protein region. In fact, the very center of it is almost exactly on the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, which again is like the main uh, site of conflict between the, the virus genome and the human genome, right, if you will. Um, <coughs> so it's a tremendously important position. Um, this is going to come up again and again and again. And in fact, the bulk of um, the most interesting evolution we've seen in, in SARS-CoV-2 is uh, essentially right on this very site within human populations as well. So I think even at the very beginning, just having sequenced the genome, we can make some pretty good predictions about what parts of, this, of the viral genome were going to be the most important for adapting quickly to human populations. Um, okay, and so uh, just to remind you, that figure is a little out of date. I still like to show it for all sorts of reasons, but um, a bunch of new sequencing has been going on, and there's going to be a ton more of this in the next, you know, five to ten years. I think uh, basically every mammal that people can catch will get a blood draw taken and sequenced to find any virus it has. Um, I don't know how much we'll learn from that, but I, you know, as someone that wants to consume those data, I think that's tremendously interesting. So I'm excited for the future. Um, and uh, what you can see is we sort of filled in this gap here a little bit, right? So uh, there's there's quite a few different um, virus genomes along here. The important ones are are up here in sort of uh, yellow and <coughs> orange. It's um, B A and I don't know how I'm supposed to say it, Banal or whatever. 20-52 um, and a few others where you're basically seeing this uh, really, really high nucleotide identity across this thing. It's something like 98%, I forget the exact numbers, but basically extremely similar uh, nucleotide sequence across that region. Okay, so in other words, uh, we've, we got things at this point that are fairly consistent with the very recent ancestors of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, which is which is good, right? It's um it gives us some idea where it came from and some ideas of how to study it. Okay. Um, with that, um, again, this figure is a little out of date. I've just showed you a newer one, but they don't have a, as nice a tree figure. So unfortunately, I won't use their figure for this. <laughs> but uh, it doesn't really matter for this purpose. So um, 
SARS, the important point is that SARS-CoV-2 has a bunch of very close known relatives, right? So we have this set, uh, this was at the very beginning of all this, it's a paper from Joe et al in Current Bio, but basically what they had was um, they used three literally identical sequences from the early outbreak in Wuhan, so one, three, and four. In fact, one of these is the reference genome that we use all the time now. Um, and they, they threw it on a phylogenetic tree, as we typically do, where, where again, these are your bootstrap support values, and you can see this is a pretty well-resolved tree. I'm having trouble here. Um, this is a pretty well-resolved tree, and you can see that they have, uh, uh, you know, it's, you've got a fairly clear, consistent ancestor here, which is this, um, this rye of, I'm not going to know how to say this, Malayas. Um, the important point here is that these are both bats. Uh, and in fact, all of those newer sequences, remember I just showed you a bunch here that are even more closely related, were also isolated in bats. So uh, a reasonable conclusion is that SARS-CoV-2 has very recently emerged in human populations um, as, uh, you know, from a recent bat ancestor. Um, but there's something else I think is kind of interesting and fun about this tree, which is if you look at the other stuff on the tree, we'll see very quickly they are a bunch of pangolins, right? So these are these scaly looking things here, uh, which, which kind of goes back to the point I made at the beginning here, which is to say that there is this uh, enormous, uh, enormous rate of zoonosis events. So that's jumps between species. And it's obviously not just animals into humans, but even between animal species. And so if you look at this tree, there's, so no, there's sort of no way to explain this other than at least one jump from pangolins into bats. But of course, these viruses are so, uh, you know, closely related, they didn't speciate with these pangolin species. And so, uh, of course, there's actually been many jumps between pangolins and probably between bats and all over the place as well. So again, zoonotic transfer is extremely common as far as I can tell. Um, the other thing that you can, of course, do is molecular dating approaches. So you basically count up your nucleotide differences between these things and you say, well, how old was this event here, this node of the tree? In this case, it appears to be, uh, you know, something like 50 years. And of course, the, the newer stuff is even more closely related. So we have stuff that's, you know, maybe five or 10 years diversion from SARS-CoV-2 that's been identified, which is a really, really good sign for starting to track down the origins of these things. Um, okay, so that was a very long lead in uh, to the origins of this thing, kind of how the virus genome basically works. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing now to study um, the spread of SARS-CoV-2 within human populations. And so uh, I like to start with this. So this is a screen grab from NCBI virus. It's this really uh, nice data portal that NCBI has produced to interact with these data and filter in all sorts of nice ways. Um, this is just a very basic screen grab, but I encourage you to play with it, um, where I'm showing you the collection date for sequence genomes and the release date. And of course, um, there's no axis on this, so you don't have quite the impression that I do. But basically, there's, uh, you know, on certain days, there have been as many as 30, 40,000 sequences submitted to this portal. So um, the point is, these data are increasingly available. It's growing at just an incredible rate. There's in the public sphere, stuff I can share freely, there's maybe 2.3 million total genome sequences. And I think in aggregate, our current biggest tree is somewhere in the range of 4.3 million total genomes. So there is an absolute ton of genome sequence data. Um, and that's of course, I think probably not all that surprising. You know, SARS-CoV-2 is, is the, uh, the first, <laughs> well, it's the first pandemic in quite a while, but it's certainly the first pandemic to occur uh, very firmly into the genome sequencing era, right? So you know, for about $30, $40, you can sequence one of these genomes. Um, that price can go down in certain contexts, but it's not, the short answer is it's extremely available. It is not very hard to do. And what that's mean, what that meant more than anything else is that uh, the problems of studying SARS-CoV-2 are now essentially a data science problem. It's, uh, you know, we're in evolution and population genetics, I think for the past hundred years or so, people have been really concerned with this idea of, uh, if I take a sample from a population, what can I learn about the population parameters? We are now sort of converging on a world where uh, you're not going to sample population, uh, you're not gonna take samples, you're gonna literally sample the entire population. <laughs> and so the uncertainty that, you are, that you're dealing with actually isn't a, uh, isn't a randomness of sampling uncertainty at all. There's of course other uncertainty in this, but it's a very, it's dramatically different than I think the way that most people have thought about uh, how to do these kinds of inferences, how to learn from these data. And it's something we really need to think about. And of course, you know, Vladimir has been working on really fun stuff. You got a, 
you know, VG Sim is this really cool simulator that that um, you know relaxes some of the problems I think the coalescent would have in these cases. And so it's been, uh, you know, it's there's going to be a ton of work to do uh, thinking about how to reimagine, you know, evolutionary genetics inference to to handle the future of this stuff, which is um, literally we sample everything all the time. And how do we how do we work with those data? How do we organize and catalog those data? And then what can we learn from that? Um, <clears throat> Okay, uh, this is probably disturbingly obvious to you, but I'm still going to walk through it because it's important. Uh, uh, the the question, you know, the thing is, how does <coughs> viral transmission define a tree? So, uh, viral transmission is this thing where, uh, just like those larger trees you see between species, uh, you know, there's an individual that's initially infected, <coughs> and they may go on to infect two descendant individuals, who uh, infect some other number of individuals. In the early phases of this of the pandemic, the, you know, the average number of individuals a given infected individual would, would also infect with something like three or so. Um, that number varies like crazy. It depends on who's vaccinated and who has immunity and all sorts of things. But um, the short version is SARS-CoV-2 was pretty darn transmissible from the beginning and it's actually become much more transmissible uh, over time. Um, but basically you have this tree-like structure that comes out of this, as you can imagine, and of course, uh, as the mutations accumulate over time, you're able to trace this thing back. So what we're doing is we're using virus genome sequences to be able to figure out what's related to each other, exactly like uh, you know classic phylogenetics, what I just showed you. Hopefully, completely obvious. The important difference here, uh, and this is something I was I was mentioning on the previous slide, is that uh, because we're sampling almost everything, <laughs> uh, that's that's an exaggeration, but we're sampling a lot. Um, and because SARS-CoV-2 has a relatively low mutation rate, we actually don't have a lot of mutations to work with, right? So if the, if the average rate of mutation is one per every, say, three transmissions or so, it means that there's going to be a lot of literally identical genomes that we're going to sample. So cases like this, where these two are literally identical, are extremely common. And in fact, um, they, we have many other cases where there's hundreds of genomes, there may even be thousands of genomes, that had been essentially or literally identical uh, when when sequenced. Uh, so it, it makes it it means there's also this sort of challenge because the the information content of each of these genomes is actually quite low uh, relative to what we already know about, but it still tells you something more. And so how that's one of the main challenges that we've been dealing with, uh, which is of course is dramatically different from the comparative genomics problem, where if anything there are too many mutations and a, a site may be saturated because many mutations have occurred at one site. That's not the problem here. The problem here is that there just are no mutations. <laughs> we have a very different issue going on. Um, okay, so um, before I get into this, I'm gonna to to take a short break. I'm going to paste in the chat a fun thing we've been working on. Um, you, my suggestion is just play around with it for now, or if you're gonna do small group things, you can, but I don't think that's necessary. Um, so here, let me stop the Here's the chat, okay. Um, so this is a website we've been building up uh, called Cluster Tracker. Um, it's currently just for the United States uh, for various reasons that I won't go into, but uh, basically what it is is a way of estimating the rates um, or the frequency of introduction events into a given area, and then you can actually view those events, right? So the, the resulting subtrees, if you click view cluster down here. And so I'm gonna set you guys loose playing with that while I uh, deal with my morning briefly, and I'll be right back. <laughs> Thanks.
Okay, welcome back. Um, thank you all for waiting for just a second. Before I go on a whole lot from here, I wonder if any of you have any questions about the first part uh, of this, you know, functional genomics origins of SARS-CoV-2, anything fun like that. I'll give you a minute <laughs> to ask. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm a bit interested. Uh, you must know, you might know, well, I'm sure you know that there was a pandemic in the beginning of the 20th century, like, I don't remember how it's called, Spanish something something. 1918, yep. yep. Yeah, like uh, just uh, after the First World War. And I'm just curious, did any data which was maybe available at this time. Yeah, I understand that, it, that this was quite long ago, but did like any data was of use while studying the oh, pandemics it, or something, something, no? I, you know, I got to imagine, yes. So I, you know, <laughs> I think, um, certainly epidemiology has been around for a long time. Like before we could study these genomes in genomic epidemiology, you know, predicting the spread of disease has been a major subject of research for a very long time. So I got to think that's informed the models and the way they think about these things. Um, the truth is, uh, for what I'm doing, no, <laughs> because most of the problems we're solving are, are, are sort of data science issues and thinking about how do you can deal with these data at scale, that kind of thing. Um, but the, but the, uh, the, of course, I think, you know, all of the events that have come before give us some information about how this will work. Does that sort of answer your question? I'm sorry if I've missed the point. Well, yeah, yeah, I got. But basically, if we have no, by the way, do you know the genome of the Spanish something something? I forgot how to, what the exact name, sorry. Do we know the genome of this? It's a Spanish flu is the common term yeah. for this. Yeah, Spanish than, flu, yeah right. People often say the 1918 flu. Um, which I think are both fine. Um, I don't think, actually, I don't even know. That's a good question. Um, if there were like frozen samples or something that we could get to. Um, there are certainly flu genome sequences, at least from the fifties. And I gotta think earlier, there must be some. I should know more about this. I should study the history of this. So <laughs> I'll have to get back to you about that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I will just yeah. curious. Cause yeah. the, you it's know, so that's like the last pandemics we ever had, like the real yeah. pandemics. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's the yeah, last big pandemic, at least, if you will. <laughs> There's been a bunch of little mini ones, right? Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I didn't really have an answer for you, but any other questions? Oh, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, please interrupt me anytime, by the way. I think this is a small enough group. It's, you know, 18 people or 20 people or something like that, that um, it really will not be that disruptive if you just get stop me when you have questions. And I'll try to answer them. If you put them in the chat, I will also try to monitor this. Um, I realize that that may not be as easy for you, but I'll at least try to pay attention and let, let you know if I have answers. So, okay. Um, with that, I'll just, oh, I should go back to presenter mode, of course. Um, okay. So um, some this is one of the most fun observations. Sorry, none of this is really fun. It's a pandemic, but you know, one of the more interesting observations that we've been able to get out of all these genome sequences so far. And what it basically comes down to is uh, there's a specific uh, mutational signature that we would expect to see uh, if these host uh, human defense proteins are working and affecting the virus, right? And so what these are is, um, they're called APOBEX and uh, some are also ADARs and there may be others that I don't know about, but at least APOBEX and ADARs are these human proteins that actually will go along and modify the, the viral genome. So they do this by deamination. I won't go into like the biochemistry of that at all. I'll just say that uh, what they do is they come along and in, in the particular case that is the most common as far as we can tell, they'll modify a cytosine to uracil, right? So it's, it's modified. And then at the end, you have this, um, hopefully, you know, if that, if that cytosine was really important to viral function, it may be that it creates a defective virus by, by inserting this uracil here. And so this is a part of the human defense against the virus. And so the question came up very early is, you know, is this human defense um, mechanism and, and uh, you know, suite of defense molecules affecting viral evolution? And so 
Um, pretty quickly, a guy named Peter Simmons put out a preprint on this uh, before us. Darn that guy. Um, but like what he showed was that, sure, exactly what you might expect is happening, which is uh, an enormous excess of these CDU mutations in the genome relative to kind of the other major classes of mutation that we might expect to see as well. So A to G, G to A, U to C, et cetera, um, which, which suggests that, that something like this might be going on and that actually the, the human defense system mechanism is, is shaping viral genome evolution. And um, in our own analysis, which I think went a little bit deeper on this question, um, what we did was uh, we, we took, a, uh, at the time, a very large tree. I think it was maybe four or 500,000 samples. And we said, well, how common are each of these you know, mutation types? And does it matter if there's only one descendant, two to four descendants of a given node, or four descendants? The idea being that if, if there were lots of errors in our genome sequencing, so for example, if there were RNA damage uh, between the sample and the genome sequencing that had nothing to do with the with the actual effects of human genome uh, editing, we might only see a bunch of one descendant mutations. That is to say that mutations that occurred in only exactly one uh, descendant sample, the logic being that they were errors, right? Or, or maybe they aren't errors, but they're sequencing artifacts associated with RNA damage for whatever reason. Um, so uh, what we did was we broke it down. We said, well, we should see a similar excess across all of these categories, one, two to four, greater than four. And then of course in green, you're just seeing the possible number of sites for a given mutation. Um, all of this uh, is, is uh, unique to the plus strand, of course, right? So, so a CDU on one strand is a G to A on the other strand of the virus. So everything's on the plus strand. And what you see is the same sort of excess, right? This is enormous number of CDU mutations and GDU mutations. And importantly on the on the right, what we show you is the potential numbers are, is, is just synonymous positions in the genome. And so you see the same sort of thing, huge excess of CDUs and GDUs uh, relative to the number we would expect, which is in green here. So right? we don't expect a lot of synonymous GDU. This is just a bias of the genetic code of all things where you know a, a given codon is um, a given codon. Uh, there are very, very few synonymous GDU mutations that can occur in, in you know, the average genetic code, whereas CDU is quite common. So that's why this one shows the biggest excess is probably that there's many more potentially neutral CDU than GDU mutations. Um, okay, but again, strongly suggests that the human genome is actually, or the human defense mechanisms, humans proteins, are actually shaping viral genome evolution, which again is a tremendously interesting thing, right? So the virus will affect human evolution, but of course uh, we can do the opposite. Uh, and this observation was uh, really important for understanding the evolution of the virus because uh, there were a number of, of early analyses that came out that said, well, there must be, um, if we assume that the GC content of the viral genome is at equilibrium, that is, uh, the, across all species the virus can inhabit, you get the exact same equilibrium GC content. What it would suggest is that there's actually fairly strong selection against uh, CDU mutations and GDU mutations, right? The idea being that, well, the, you know, if, if this mutation profile we see here was at equilibrium, obviously there'd be a ton more uh, uracil on the plus strand of the virus. So it cannot be that this is, this is at equilibrium, right? And so the, this is, I won't go into details, but there's a number of groups that made this argument. Um, and the, the point that I think is really worth making here and that, that I won't show you figures for because there aren't nice figures is that, um, this isn't really, that, that, is, that assumption, this equilibrium GC content assumption uh, is probably not really valid, right? So, so, you know, if the other host species that these viruses typically inhabit don't have quite the same rate of viral genome editing as the humans, as humans do, then uh, we may not be at equilibrium. And it may be that every time the virus jumps between hosts and stays for a long time in a new host, that the actual GC content of the genome itself is shifted. Um, and th this of course is a, is just conjecture at this point. It's sort of an open question, but I think it's tremendously likely that actually the that we'll see this sort of over time the the human defense mechanisms will actually shape the virus genome to more closely match the mutational profile that's induced by living in like living in humans rather than living in bats and pangolins and things like this. Um, but we'll see. Time will tell. Okay. The other thing this tells us. 
I think it's tremendously important, so I like to spend a bit of time on this, is that there's this huge excess, right? It's GDU and CDU mutations. Well, if it's GDU and CDU, but you don't see the opposite, right? Like I don't see a bunch of C to A and G to A mutations. There actually are some, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the, the bulk of them are GDU and CDU. Um, if the bulk of mutations are GDU and CDU, then it, uh, it strongly suggests that these mutations are occurring preferentially on the plus strand of the virus, right? That is to say, uh, because we're not seeing the, the reverse complements of them, which would be minus strand, uh, it, it, it strongly suggests that most of the time the virus is in a human cell, it's just sitting in this plus stranded form, uh, you know, where, it's, where the only uh, sites that are accessible are, are GDU and CDU. Um, we don't know this, but I think it's a fair inference to make from this kind of information, and it strongly suggests that that it has quite a lot of time as a single-stranded plus-stranded virus um, when it's not just uh, double-strand RNA during replication, for example, as shown here, um, and as you might expect. Okay. Um, so the really cool thing about this, and this hopefully will not be news to anybody, it's a it's a screen grab I took from nextstrain.org, um, just from the earliest phases of the pandemic, is that you can actually trace this stuff, right, in, in sort of semi-real time. And this would be an example of what we call uh, uh, viral surveillance. In other words, we're asking what strains of the virus are where and when. This, there is a tree structure that underlies this because of course there must be, but that's not what we're showing you here. What we're gonna show you here is colors that correspond to each of, and it will work, hey, live in the dream. Um, what we're gonna show you here is colors that correspond to each of the major clades. And of course, early on, there wasn't a lot of diversity. So it's all this sort of orangish clade here. Um, it quickly spreads out into the rest of the world and you see stuff starting to pop up. Um, it's very likely the virus was in other places like in Africa and others, but the sampling frequency is you know, much higher in Europe and North America than it is in other places. <coughs> and of course, over time, you see this blue clade evolve and pretty quickly uh, to start to displace other things. And so that blue clade in this case is uh, a particular mutation that I'll talk about in a second. Um, that is one of the first that uh, was associated with the viral uh, adaptation to living in human host populations, right? And so um, you can do you can do very. I just want to have something going in the background while I talk. <laughs> so you can do uh, very similar kinds of things you, uh, for any given time point or through time on next strain. So again, this is a really beautiful platform for exploring. Uh, virus genome, you know, uh, uh, variation and evolution and, uh, and surveillance across the world, right? And so again, D614G evolves and it, it quickly spreads through everything else, um, which is a, which of course was the first evidence of adaptation. So with that, um, so this can tell us a bunch of things, right? So we're tracing these viruses, it can tell us many things. And in fact, when I talk to public health officers about this stuff, almost always the very first question they ask me is, uh, something about the number of introductions into a given area, right? So I I've worked quite a bit with the Santa Cruz local public health office. That's why all my figures say things like Santa Cruz. Uh, and I've made figures like this to try to explain to them that if we sample these two individuals in Santa Cruz, because of this tree structure we infer for everything else, we can pretty easily surmise that there were at least two distinct introductions into Santa Cruz, right? So that, that's the kind of much finer scale resolution. So to contrast this, and it will come up later as well, to contrast this with this other thing that I'm showing you on next strain, which is what we call genomic surveillance, this I would I would describe as this much finer grain thing where I'm really looking for little tiny sublineages and little tiny branches of the tree um, at incredibly fine scale resolution. Right? And of course, you could do this at even finer scales like neighborhood level or things like that. Um, those data are very rarely available to me, so I don't. Um, but there's there's nothing prevents us you know, really going through and linking all these things with epidemiological information and trying to figure out who's related to who and how. Um, so this is this is really more what I'm trying to do in my research is typically things at this scale where I'm where I'm really trying to deal with the tiny fine scale edges of the tree, if you will. Okay. So um, there is this rapid global spread from China. So the um, what you uh, what we were able to do very early on when we had all these sequences was start to make these trees. And this is a time tree, right? And what that basically means is that your x-axis is uh, is not proportional to mutations or maybe related to mutations, but it's not 
counting mutations. What it's counting is time each of these samples was taken, and then also the the in estimates of the internal nodes. So the times that these nodes may have existed is is estimated, but you know you can do a reasonably good job because this is so densely sampled. Uh, it's really not that hard to do. Um, and so this is uh, one of the first ones. One of the first analysis that came out, um, it was on BioArchive very early and then in science not that long after, which basically shows that, yeah, as you might expect, um, almost certainly this thing was initially in China and then it came out into uh, other places. So there's, there's early stuff from Germany here. There's this whole set up here from the USA uh, and then a bunch of others along the way here. So in, in various other different countries that have come out. Um, so in other words, Yes, at extremely fine scales, you can start to trace this stuff um, and uh, and start to figure out how the virus is getting around and to where, um, which I think is a, is a kind of an incredible thing that's come out of this pandemic is the ability to to really do these kinds of analysis. Um, a similar version of that uh, from Trevor Bedford, uh, who has you know really been kind of the leader of all of this, and he's doing an incredible job. Trevor's great um, of of all of this is is looking at. Uh, uh, how many introductions that we could infer occurred in Washington, right? And so um, you see there's actually quite a few others. We're ignoring all these little singletons here and we're just saying, let's look at the big ones that appear to have spread locally. And so there's at least three here. You can kind of see this little one down here and two big ones here and here, where again, we're seeing these big introductions into Washington. This tree is the x-axis is actually number of mutations um, where zero would be the, the reference strain and then everything else uh, is kind of some genetic distance from there. Um, if you are about you know five or six mutations in, that would suggest you're a few months uh, diverged from that reference strain. Remember, SARS-CoV-2 evolves pretty slowly, but the same basic thing is clearly going on here. Um, okay. So um, one thing that I alluded to when I was showing you the video from next screen is that uh, the virus is also adapting to host populations, right? So it's pretty clear that <coughs> the host, um, you know, our host genome is shaping the evolution of the virus in sort of direct and measurable ways, but also it's sort of indirectly shaping it because obviously there is potential to become more transmissible in a new host because you adapt to the unique environment in the host. In particular, um, that, that protein I've been sort of emphasizing the whole time, the viral spike protein is probably a big part of that. It's sort of the key mechanism that, that the virus is using to get into the host cells. And so a very simple you know, diagram of a cartoon of how that might look is, you know, if this individual is infected and they have some mixed frequency infection, uh, you know, the ancestral strain may only be a little bit transmissible, right? So the average person transmits to two or maybe one uh, descendant. But if a new mutation arises as more transmissible, they might transmit to say three or four on average. And of course, um, because of exponential growth, that, uh, that new blue mutation will become very common very, very quickly uh, in the viral population. And that's actually, we've seen that in quite a few cases now. Um, but at the time, I think it wasn't obvious exactly how fast and how strong this effect would be. Um, so uh, has this happened? Uh, of course, the answer is yes. Hopefully you all know that by now, um, but I, I think it's still worth pointing out. And in particular, this first one here, this is the mutation D614G. Uh, is, it happened very early and it's right in the middle of the spike protein, as you might expect. And we think it's probably the, the very first major adaptive event for the virus in the human host populations. Um, so yes. D614G. Of course, since then, uh, this is actually a very early figure where I'm showing you what was at the time a pretty complete phylogeny of, of everything right here, uh, which is a crazy thing because that's like 50,000 samples and now we're up to many, many millions of samples. Um, but at the time, it seems it seemed like a lot to me and I was very proud of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> time has changed that. Um, cool. So um, the... Okay, so one mutation changes the spike protein of the virus. The the this is again the spike protein is this thing here. It's this receptor or it's this um, receptor binding protein that's on the external membrane of the virus, uh, and it's able to go in and and bind. And so D six one four G. I'm not good at reading these things. I'm not a protein biologist. Is right here, which means it's actually not quite in the receptor binding domain, but it's actually you know relatively near to the receptor binding domain. And as far as we can tell. Um, you know, there were many other mutations linked to that, right? So this mutation here is also linked to this. This mutation here 
it's green, so it's synonymous. It's also linked. And of course, this one here is in the non-coding part of the genome. So who knows what it does? Um, but we're pretty sure it's this here, D614G. That's the, the most important part of this process. Again, the spike is this thing that gets you into cells. And so um, what you want to see, uh, and so like I said, D614G took over pretty quickly. So you can see it here is that early in the pandemic, when not a lot was going on, you, uh, you know, it's all the ancestral type, it's orange, and it does emerge and it kind of hangs out for a bit. And then all of a sudden, you know, somewhere in, in February or March, it just starts really taking off. And then, you know, in two or three months, it was the only kind we really saw. That's not quite true. There are still some uh, a clade, um, a clade, so the ancestral clade virus hanging around. Uh, we even see them like very occasionally today, but basically D614G has, has taken over. Um, and presumably, uh, and I, I don't think this is hundred percent known, but it's believed that the viral titer will be higher. That is, there's more virus particles, uh, presumably because it's better at entering human host cells and, and creating more of itself when it's in those cells. <laughs> Uh, and so it makes a lot of sense that this would be the case that this is adapted for the virus, because of course, if there's more of the virus, it's more likely to be transmitted to the next person. Uh, and it seems like this should be, uh, it makes a lot of sense in a very high level, right? Um, okay. Uh, and so if we look at this, um, if we look at this in a laboratory model, so we take human cells in culture and we throw in, um, we throw in the viral spike protein, we can measure binding. And so this is this really cool analysis here, which showed that, yeah, uh, this, this axis is labeled sort of non-scientifically as increasing transmissibility. But basically the thing you can get out of it is that D614G is a lot better at getting around to different cells in that dish than the ancestral uh, form of the virus, which had uh, D at position 614, not the G at 614. Okay. Um, so, uh, it was also uh, also a very interesting thing that happened very early as people started worrying about well will there be effects on um, on the uh, you know the probability of hospitalization or death right is the virus becoming more virulent uh, and the the answer as far as I can tell was no and it still seems to be no for the vast majority although there's a few cases where that may not be true um, where it doesn't look like the virus is a whole lot more uh, has a whole lot hard larger effect on virulence so this is your odds ratio of hospitalization. Uh, what you can pretty see, what you can see pretty quickly, is that um, over time there wasn't a huge increase. This mutation didn't cause a huge increase. Viral load, so the average CT value, which is sort of an indirect measurement of how many viruses are in an individual, that's not a perfect measurement, and lots of people don't like it. But let's just assume it's related to it for now. <laughs> um, has an effect, and of course, how old you are is probably the biggest effect. Older people are much more susceptible. So, um, of course, if you're immunocompromised or other things, obviously there's a very large effect there as well. Um, but again, importantly, D614G uh, probably doesn't make you <laughs> make the virus a whole lot more virulent. And like I said, I don't think uh, most mutations have had this effect as far as we can tell. Um, okay, uh, the other really cool thing about this is that these uh, antibodies that are under clinical trials, so we use antibodies to treat uh, severe cases uh, because they're able to, to bind the virus and, and tell your immune system to deal with this thing. Uh, so uh, it did not seem to affect antibody binding significantly at all. Uh, later mutations probably did. I won't go into each of those in detail, but the, the thing I'm trying to emphasize here that I think is tremendously interesting and important is uh, just how much we're able to do in real time or nearly real time as these things are happening is to be able to study them very quickly. Um, obviously, this is a whole bunch of experts that are much better uh, biologists and biochemists than I am. So I, I'm not taking, I'm not meaning to take credit for their work, but it's a it is pretty impressive and incredible what humans have been able to do to trace this virus and measure it a little bit um, through time. Okay. So what this does, uh, among other things, is it has a type of arms race. So uh, uh, th this will sound redundant with a lot of what we talked about earlier, but I think it's worth emphasizing because it's sort of the big thing that's happening in viral populations. What you've got um, with virus and host genomes is a type of arms race. So the virus is evolving to get better at getting into host cells. And over time, uh, you know, very long times, the host has to evolve to, to make that harder for the virus to do. So we also see often adaptive evolution in um, host proteins that interact with viruses. Um, this is going to be a fairly direct example, but there's lots of indirect examples as well. 
And it's sort of this lock and key mechanism that we've been talking about where you have these kind of, we imagine this case where the, the virus key, this part here, is uh, pretty well shaped to, um, to interact with this chunk here, right? This is the host receptor. And then over time, the host receptor will mutate, uh, presumably to decrease the probability of infection by new viruses and vice versa. And of course, the, the thing that I think uh, is hard to explain with these sorts of simple cartoons is that the, um, the differences among these are uh, the differences among these is the time scale, right? So a host generation for humans is, you know, maybe 28 years or something like that. So that virus is weeks or less, it's days. And so the, the problem is that the, the virus is able to mutate very, very quickly where the host kind of has to go very slowly. But I still, um, which is the main thing I like to point out here is that this lock and key mechanism or this, this sort of analogy is I think really useful for thinking about. Um, virus coevolution with hosts, but the but the time scale and the way it plays out is maybe dramatically different from the sort of thing you might imagine at the very beginning. Um, okay, there we go. Uh, so, <coughs> um, so uh, one thing that is just absolutely astounding. So I was showing you the antibody binding work a little bit earlier. This this idea here that we were able to measure. Um, these are various different antibodies that I think Regeneron was making at the time um, to, to measure this and show that, yeah, in fact, the, the antibody binding is just as good for either of these two, the ancestral form or this one, is to be able to do this in real time is a pretty incredible thing. Um, and uh, the thing that we've also been able to do in, in kind of real time is this really incredible experiment. So the um, this is mostly... Uh, all of this stuff has been worked by a guy named Tyler Starr and Jesse Bloom at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Uh, yeah, I have no idea where we would be without those two people and all their team doing all this work because they've kind of done every major analysis as far as I can tell of this stuff over time. Uh, and so um, what they do is this really neat experiment. So they basically make a library. And when I say library, I don't mean a sequencing library. What I mean is they mutagenize a... Um, a, a chunk of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, one second, please. So they, they mutagenize a chunk of the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein uh, and, they, um, and then they express this thing. There, there's other molecular tricks going on. There's a barcode sequence added and a whole bunch of other stuff. I won't, I won't <laughs> go into that at all. I'll just say they, um, they mutagenize it. They had a few mutations. Uh, to the SARS-CoV-2 uh, receptor binding domain. Uh, and then they express that in a yeast. And so the nice thing about this is you're not working with a live virus. <laughs> and so it's, it's presumably much easier to work with and you don't have as many safety protocols uh, because of course, if you work with a really live virus you might be in some real trouble, but um, SARS-CoV-2, um, so you express this in your yeast and then you put it in a dish and you, and you basically are asking uh, did this bind to the human ACE2 receptor? And the way you do that is you, you let it bind uh, and then you, you, you scoop off all the stuff that doesn't bind as well. And then at the end of all that, you, you take out everything uh, that did bind and you sequence them. And because again, they have this barcode sequence associated with this thing, we're able to figure out uh, which mutations that they introduced by just randomly adding mutations affected the binding and actually made this thing bind a little better than the ancestral form of the protein was able to bind. And you can see um, what this is colored by is uh, sort of blue would be weaker binding or um, sorry, blue would be bind stronger, white would be no change, red would be bind slightly weaker. And what you can see is that the vast majority of, of positions actually very slightly decrease binding, which would make sense if this is good at getting into human cells. Um, Many of them don't do anything, right? So there's big swaths of the genome that don't seem to have big effects. Uh, there's a few positions that seem to have very large effects. This is just a part of the, of the sequence that we're looking at here. And then of course, there's a few positions that, that seem to increase the binding as well. And a few of those were sort of predicted. So for example, one of them not shown in this figure is a position N501Y. Um, and that uh, is tremendously important because it arose on a few different genetic backgrounds, as far as we can tell. Uh, and it's, it seems like it's gone, um, you know, it's, it's emerged in quite a different set of cases. And I'll, I'll explain why I care about that in just a minute. But the important thing that I'm, I'm trying to drive to here is that 
you know, not only can we follow this thing with genomics, right? We're using genome sequences and phylogenetics to follow the virus in real time, but also we have this incredible thing that we're able to do where we're able to look at the, um, excuse me, we're able to actually uh, experimentally predict uh, which parts of the virus genome might be important for adapting to human humans. And that's, I think, just an incredible thing <laughs> that we already had this in place and that we were able to do this um, so quickly. And so, and, you know, pretty accurately, as far as we can tell, a lot of these predictions really held up. Uh, N501Y certainly has been important for the virus. There's other positions as well that were predicted that I think are, that are really tremendously interesting. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and so with that, uh, you know, you might imagine that after D614G, other variants would arise um, that would be important for viral transmission. And, and, and that, of course, did happen. And so probably the most famous at the beginning, the first of the uh, what was called the scariant right, at the time was um, that's a pun in, in, uh, in English where scare would be to be like frightened or afraid and uh, a scary a variant, of course, is a variant of the virus. So a scariant is, you know, the public is afraid of these things. And so early on, there's this rise of this, this new lineage, B.1.1.7, uh, which is the pangolin lineage name. Uh, we call it alpha as well in the WHO, um, WHO nomenclature system. And it, I don't know, it's like 20i or something in next clade. Anyway, it's got a bunch of different names. Alpha is fine. Um, and, uh, and again, this is a screen graph from next strain just to show you how quickly this can happen. What you can see is at the beginning, everything's kind of blue as you would expect. Um, and they'll color it, um, that light green color. Yeah, exactly. So light green is sort of spreading quickly, it looks like. But then actually, this one is alpha, is this orange or red thing here. What you can see is once it starts taking off, it takes off everywhere, right? So it isn't, this is just the earliest days of this thing. It was around uh, December of, uh, of last year. And you can see that just starts slowly, but then as you would expect with logistic growth and very strong selection, the thing just takes off everywhere in the world. Everywhere that's measuring it has this enormous influx of, of alpha B117. And so uh, for a while there, we thought B117 was going to become uh, the ancestor of all present day uh, virus diversity. Um, I don't have a video made for Delta. It's a little harder to do that. But of course, uh, B117 did not ultimately win <laughs> this battle. It was, uh, it was Delta that's um, B.1.617.2 uh, or something like this uh, that, that ultimately was able to win. Uh, and and for now. yeah, what's up? Yeah, I say for now. So we can yes, tell about yes. like ultimately. <laughs> Because if you are to give that talk like a year ago, we would tell, talk about, oh yeah, Alpha, it ultimately won the battle, yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Totally, totally fair point. So Dimitri's point, which I think is uh, really important is, um, this is of course a guess about what will happen, right? So it's true that the bulk of the viruses sequenced today, almost 100% in the United States and many other places are Delta descendants. Um, but uh, it is entirely possible that there is uh, somewhere else in the world that we're not sequencing as deeply that, that has its own special variant that's even more transmissible than Delta. Um, I think what's gonna happen, and I, who knows, is that eventually we will uh, we'll coalesce, right? All the viruses will be descendants of Delta. And then what will happen is some new variant will arise from within Delta because of course, now that Delta is so common, the vast majority of new mutations that are arising are arising within Delta as well. So future adaptation is very likely to come from there. But Dimitri's right, I should be, uh, you know, I don't think we've been great at predicting what would happen with this virus in general, although there's been some things we've been really impressed with that. Um, and so I should be careful about how I say this. So fair enough, thank you. Um, uh, just a small question. Does yeah. all the types of viruses which are well, a strong and dominated have this feature because of the high transmissi transmissibility. Are any feature, are any other features uh, have effect like maybe the longevity or treatment resistance or something? Or is it all about transmissibility? Good question. Um, probably viral fitness has a lot of components is my guess. I think that transmissibility is probably the big one because uh, a virus life cycle is very much about getting to the next host, right? Like everything it's doing within one host is about getting to the next host. Um, with that said, 
you know, I think there's probably a lot of different things that affect viral fitness beyond transmissibility. It's just the number one thing we talk about. Um, so I'm not a virologist, nor am I an expert on this immune escape. Yeah, so immunity escape would be a good example of this. Although I think um, there's a reasonable argument that that's essentially about transmissibility at some level as well, but it's true that it's uh, slightly different uh, than, than transmissibility. So um, certainly we think some of the mutations that are arising and spreading today are related to immunity, um, you know, affecting the binding of antibodies. And, uh, and I, I certainly expect that to be an important part of this. It's, um, I think typically this is called antigenic drift is essentially the virus changes over time, antibodies are less good at binding to it, and it's sort of this drift, drift and or selection process that's ongoing. Um, cool. Does anyone else have questions about this before I move on? This is a great question, by the way, Dimitri. Well, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, no, no questions. Okay. Uh, we can go on. The, I should warn you all, the timing of these things is very much assuming that you will ask me questions. And if you don't, uh, I may be done quickly and then I'll have to just subject you to whatever I've got on hand. So, so you oh, should ask if you, me. you don't, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we'll get there. Um, okay, uh, there we go. Um, this, you probably all know, how do you quantify the spread of the virus? It's, uh, it's a growth rate function. The only thing I think is worth pointing out here is just how dramatically different the outcomes are if your growth rate is 1.9 versus 3.1, right? So if it's three, and of course, you know, at the very beginning of this, the confidence intervals were enormous on what we thought RO was. <laughs> I think we all uh, uh, had some trouble. I think you guys had your own, uh, Vladimir, I think, and maybe others estimated RO for, um, for samples in Russia. Do you remember what that was, Vladimir? What number did you get? Uh, yeah, I think it was around 2.5. Yeah, so it was in the, is this blue line more or less in the range here. Um, but uh, the thing I like to emphasize is these numbers are not that different, right? It's 3.1 down to 1.9, and yet the outcomes are dramatically different. So um, clearly transmissibility must matter quite a lot for a virus uh, to spread and, and, and multiply in human populations. Uh, but yeah, 2.5 is in the range. I think a lot of people get numbers around there uh, for the early spread, three to like, was like two to three is pretty common, yeah. Yeah, it was our estimate for um, that Vredon hospital. Ah, okay, for a specific hospital. hospital. Uh, yeah, it was like within uh, within just one small community. Yeah. Uh, well, I think all these things are at some level, right? So fair enough. Um, that's cool. That's great. Yeah, and that, I think that's one really fun thing that's come out of this is, you know, uh, genomic epidemiology is is pretty good at doing these kinds of things. Um, obviously, uh, standard epidemiology that doesn't know how the virus is related can also, but the, the genomic stuff is a tremendously important component of this. Cool. Um, so this is just to show that a slightly different way. Um, if it's becoming, uh, if you're wondering why the UK is featured in all of this, it's because they have done the best job of sampling everything. <laughs> so uh, Public Health England has just been incredible. They've got, um, just fantastic, fantastic work sampling such a large proportion, maybe 10% of all positive cases in the UK. It, it varies depending on the case rates and all sorts of things, but a lot of people have been sampled, which I think is a really cool thing. And what they were able to show uh, very quickly is that if you just break it down into individual, I think these are called counties here as well. So if you break it down to individual counties, what we see as the virus is spreading is this thing where there's a uh, there's this increase in spread and this is, they're calling it week 48 and 50. Um, what that is, is basically uh, when alpha was spreading in the UK, right? If you will, um, I think it's week 48 and 50 of the pandemic. So more or less when alpha was really starting to take off in the UK, we see that it was increasing in almost every single county um, that, we, uh, that you could find. And so again, suggesting that there is a, a tremendously important component of fitness that's going on here that a new variant was very, very important. Um, one other thing I think is really interesting, which I'll talk about sort of here, um, is just how many times we see these mutations to the same allele, right? So this, this position, N501Y, it was predicted by Tyler Starr and, and the, the sort of experimental work, and then right around the same time, which I, I still think is kind of an amazing thing, you see several uh, distinct evolutions of N501Y. So this is, um, this is uh, let's see, alpha's here, 
I want to say this is beta and this is gamma, but I could be wrong about that. So uh, the, the, at the time they were called these other things and I can't go back and recreate this snapshot, unfortunately. So, so you got to work with me on this, but um, uh, you know, each of these, uh, and I, I don't think you should worry too much. Go back. Come on. Okay. You shouldn't worry too much about the relative sizes of the clades um, because the, uh, because the, you know, the UK is where alpha emerged and it was uh, by far doing a much better job of sequencing than South Africa and Brazil at the time. And so the, the differences were, were fairly dramatic. Um, but, the, but right around the same time, they all sort of emerged. Um, one thing I think is really interesting to point out, and I, I don't have a specific figure for it, so bear with me, but um, this alpha branch is really long, right? There aren't a lot of uh, this is in time, but I think it's fine to think of it as, as mutations as well. There aren't a lot of samples that branch off of alpha, right? So it's, it's this long, long branch. And when, what's going on there is that uh, alpha was this weird thing that kind of emerged uh, with something like 19 unique mutations on it. Um, and so the, there's been speculation about how that happened. And one idea is that um, there was a lot, there was a long-term infection in an immunocompromised individual during which alpha was able to acquire tons and tons of mutations that were that made it better at getting into cells. Um, and the, the, the reason that that might work is because within an individual, there's thousands or millions of viral particles. So selection can be pretty efficient. But when you have transmission events between individuals, the number of viral particles is a tiny number. It's, you know, maybe three to 10. Um, I don't think anyone knows the exact number, but it's a low number. And so selection tends to be much less efficient under those circumstances because uh, it's sort of, a, it's a huge chance event. It's a lottery, basically. <laughs> Am I the virus particle that got into that infection? Uh, and so th this is something that I think is potentially really interesting and important. Um, it's hard to know, of course, because there's a lot of uncertainty in all this, but it's still, I think, uh, you know, really interesting to think about. Um, okay, so these all emerge at the same time. The, the other thing we might think about for that is that, you know, if the exact same mutations emerging at many different places, it strongly suggests that natural selection is a, uh, you know, is the reason for this, right? Like, why is that same thing growing in several different places? Natural selection is probably the answer to that question. Um, so, uh, and of course, we've seen more of that since then. So position 452 is, uh, as far as we can tell, tremendously important as well. Uh, 680 and 681 see a lot, a lot, a lot of recurrent mutation at that exact position in the genome. So again, there's, um, there's a pretty good idea that there's quite a lot going on here. Um, okay. Uh, and uh, just to give you a quick summary, it looks like Delta's cut off at the bottom. All my slides are a little cut off. I'm sorry, sorry about that. It's a conversion issue, but um, basically uh, Alpha has spread, rapid, uh, spread rapidly from Southeast England. Um, it was something like 40 to 70% more contagious. So in other words, your RO increases by 40 to 70%, uh, possibly due to this mutation and many other mutations. Um, there's also this other mutation that we think is probably very important for it for K, which is an antibody escape mutation. It did not end up being super abundant in alpha, but it but it is has shown up in quite a few other cases, including gamma, which is down here, P1, and beta also has 484K, right? Um, these also have 501Y and 484K. Again, we think this affects antibody binding quite a bit, so we, we're pretty sure it's an important mutation. Other fun mutations are 417N, which is also related to antibody escape um, and, and other stuff like this. And so uh, Delta, well, okay, it's cut off, but Delta also has some of these as well, um, as well as its own set of unique and special mutations. Um, currently, again, Delta is like the one that we're following now because it has become by far the most abundant, but, uh, but yeah, um, they all kind of arose and, and, have, and have been able to spread in unique and wonderful ways. So, um, so uh, with that, Bill, um, this is again showing you, uh, this is a screen grab from the genome browser. I don't know how many of you have used the UCSC genome browser. I highly recommend it for obvious reasons, um, but it really is a good resource for things like this, where you wanna be able to cross-reference lots of genomic information really quickly. And so in this case, what I'm showing you is um, the sort of region of interest is what Unipro called this, but basically that, that corresponds to the receptor binding domain here that binds the ACE2 receptor in humans. Um, what you can see is a lot of the mutations that we think are important are in this receptor binding domain. So here's N501, here's E484K, 453, 452 have been tremendously important as far as we can tell. 
And there's others that pop up as well. So I believe this is 417 here. So um, what we're basically seeing is this is antibody escape again from Jesse Bloom's lab, um, where we've sort of collapsed to show that, you know, kind of the average across a bunch of different mutations. And you can see these sort of nice peaks here where it's pretty clear that mutations that arise in these regions and these regions um, might affect antibody escape. So 484K is right on top of one of the biggest ones. Um, and we, we think it's probably a very important part of this process. So again, uh, receptor binding domain and spike is the main site of viral uh, evolutionary diversity and divergence. And it's something we're following uh, really closely. Okay. Um, I think I throw these in here because I think this can be confusing to people. I don't think it's actually all that interesting. So I'll try to do it quickly. Um, often the big goal of all of this stuff is to identify types or subtypes of the virus. And the reason people really did this uh, is because they didn't have a way to infer uh, the full evolutionary tree of all their stuff. And they just wanted to be able to say, well, that one's kind of like this one and move on. And so there were two main systems that were used for this. Um, Gizate also has one, but no one uses it. So feel free to ignore it. But there are two main systems. There's the next clade uh, system, which is what next strain does. And then the pangolin system of lineages as well. There is now actually a third sort of system, which is the who's, uh, Variants of concern, alpha, beta, gamma, delta, the, the Greek letter system. Uh, but that those almost always map on to these others anyway, so I don't worry about it too much. Um, the thing you should know about them is next grain, next strains is intentionally a uh, pretty coarse grain system. So they're just naming things in a way that allows them to, uh, to be able to accurately measure these. And so they typically want there to be a few unique mutations. And you see this, it's sort of this was zoomed all the way out and there were at the time like eight or nine clades. There's a few more now, but uh, it really hasn't been, um, they're not trying to get really fine grain resolution. Whereas what Pangolin's trying to do, you can see this is um, basically a rainbow of colors and it's because there's now several thousand uh, Pangolin lineages that have been defined. And so it's, it's, it's this really fine grain thing where people wanna be able to zoom in at, at you know, extremely fine grain detail. Right now there's, um, in Delta there's, I think 38 sublineages total uh, already defined. And of course, many more will be defined very soon. Okay, so I'm gonna need another quick break here. I will also, as last time, I will, um, I will leave you with something kind of fun. I don't know how many of you have seen this yet. This is a tool from a guy named Theo Sanderson, um, which uh, I've been showing you next strain stuff, but I really love this tool as well. So that should work. Let's throw that in here. Um, if you go to this link, it'll take a second to load, um, but the beautiful thing is you can explore the full tree. And so just to orient you really quickly, uh, and it's, it's a fairly up-to-date tree. Um, there's, of course, some errant sequences like this here, <laughs> but uh, it's a fairly up-to-date tree. Uh, it's our tree, actually. It's as up-to-date as we have it um, with the public tree, so it's about 2.1 million, a little less than 2.1 million sequences. And what you can see here is this is alpha here. Um, and this is Delta here with all the sublineages, AY, whatever in it. So if you want to explore it, you can actually search directly for certain samples. So if we search your country, let's try Russia. Uh, yep, okay, there aren't many. Uh, and that's not unusual. It's because most people don't put their data into public sequence repositories. They put them in Gizay, which we cannot share. But if you zoom in on those, you'll see them. Oh, I lost it. Okay. If you zoom in on a few, you'll see them like here, for example, is a Russian sample. Um, so mess around with that, have fun. I'll be right back in just a second. And thanks so much.
Hello. I realized I'm still sharing my screens. You've all just seen my emails very briefly. But anyway, hello. How's everybody doing? Did you um, did everyone check out Cove 2 Tree and or Tech Sodium? Is it interesting? Is it boring? It's I'm fine. Here. I'm not here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I think it's amazing. <laughs> I'm sorry if uh, it's uh, I think it's an incredible thing. We had, you know, at the very beginning of this whole thing, when we started making really big trees, we said, and people would ask me like, well, how can I see the tree? And I would go, well, you can't really see the tree. <laughs> and now we at least have an answer for them, which is, yes, you can go to Taxodium and you can check it out there. So, okay. Um, so what we're gonna be doing, um, uh, at the end here, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what I kind of think the future of this looks like. Uh, and and it'll, it, hopefully what it will do is it'll set up what I'm going to talk about the next two times, which is kind of how we're doing this stuff to trace the pandemic in real time and what we think uh, what we think will be really fun and interesting about that. Uh, before I do that, does anyone have any questions or anything about the previous sections? No, okay, you guys are easy. Um, all right, so um, this is, I, I will reiterate a lot of this next time, but uh, just to tell you, you know, to return to this problem we've had. And like I said, this is really, really been more of a computer science and a data science issue than it's than it has been an evolutionary inference issue, in my opinion. Uh, and the, the big reason is the data, in a pandemic, your data just sort of flow in, right? All the time, the data's flowing in. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd like to have the most up-to-date uh, representation of those data, phylogenetic tree. And so a typical workflow would do something like this. It would gather all the data and it would infer the tree. And it would do this exactly one time. The problem is, as soon as you've inferred your tree, it's actually already out of date, right? You cannot, you cannot, uh, you you cannot do this one time and stop because by the time I finish my tree, there's thousands of new genomes in my database, and I need to just start again, basically. And so what you do is you kick it off and you say, okay, we're gonna we're gonna work with this. There's a lot of new data. How do we deal with that? And uh, well, you can add those and then re-infer the tree with the new stuff added, and then great, I've solved my problem. Except that. I haven't because literally the exact same problem has happened again, which is that a bunch of new data has shown up uh, while I was inferring that second tree and I'm already out of date again. And in fact, this problem just gets worse and worse and worse every day because as you have more and more data, it takes more and more time to infer this full tree. And so I'm a little bit further out of date with every shot. And actually um, today with having, you know, something in the range of 4.5 million sequences available, it's uh, not even possible to infer the full tree. Uh, so we literally cannot do this. <laughs> and uh, and uh, there wasn't really a good solution to this problem at the time. And so what we have done since then is start to think, try to reimagine this process. What should real-time phylogenetics look like? And if, I, if I was gonna do this sort of thing and I was gonna give you the power of having a completely comprehensive phylogenetic tree that is every single genome sequence that's available is in my tree, what would this look like? And let's reimagine this process a little bit. And so the idea is, um, obviously in the background, I'll be maintaining a big tree of everything I know about, but a, a user also wants to be able to add their stuff to it very quickly, right? As soon as you get a new genome sequence, you should be able to add it to the tree. And so the idea is a user will upload somewhere between you know, one and a hundred sequences. And what they wanna know is the relationships among each sample. And what they wanna get a part of that is simultaneous placement on the global phylogeny. In other words, what you really wanna be able to do is figure out how your samples are related to each other and how they're related to everything else. And the idea behind this is it will empower what we're calling genomic contact tracing. Um, the other side of this is the requirements, right? So what would this, what does this need to be able to do? Uh, well, you need to accurately place sequences onto a global phylogeny. Um, you need to be able to construct trees for the user samples. What you'd like to be able to do is enable co-visualization of the data of the tree and the genetic variation data. And, and the sort of classic principle of web development is eight seconds or less. Uh, that has been hard to do in some cases. Initially, it was very possible. Now we're a little bit out of date on that, um, but it's still pretty quick in the grand scheme of things. Um, have any of you actually tried our web interface for this called Usher? Has anyone tried that? No? Well, I did that long ago. I guess that the first school was at like a year, a half a year, a half a year, I guess. Yeah, the, the source code is an important part of this too. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, very good. So um, 
the, you know, originally when I started working on this, I, you know, I said, well, probably somebody solved this problem. Phylogenetics is an old question. Um, and so we started working with a few of the methods that existed for placing samples onto trees. And we said, well, you'll want to, you'll have to be able to place, say, a thousand sequences at a time, maybe more, maybe less. Um, now, of course, it's hundreds of thousands. Um, and so what we had were uh, Pagan 2, IQ Tree 2, uh, Tree Best, and RaxML uh, evolutionary placement algorithm, which I think is EPANG or has some other name. Um, and what we found, and this is back when we were working with a tree of about 40,000 samples uh, as our base tree, and then we're adding a thousand to that. What we found was that each of these things wouldn't complete in a day, which basically means they're useless because I could just reinfer the whole tree from scratch in a day. So this cannot be the way we do this. Um, and so what we did um, was start to think about why they're so slow. Well, they're so slow because you would read the tree and your multiple sequence alignment. And then you'd go through that multiple sequence alignment and you'd annotate the branches with those mutations. And uh, you could do this with maximum likelihood or parsimony. Um, there's a few different alternatives here. Uh, for the purposes of really, really big trees, everything's in parsimony anyway, but um, that's neither here nor there. Um, at the end of that, you would place new samples onto the annotated tree. Um, and the, the problem with this approach is, is that I'm spending a lot of my time re-annotating my tree. Right? Like I can't store those annotations. There's actually a bunch of other things, but that's sort of the key algorithmic issue is that uh, I, I'm storing these as two separate data objects and really I don't want it that way. And so what a postdoc in my lab, uh, who was at UCSC at the time, I should update this, he's actually now at UCSD. He started his professorship there. Um, what we did was come up with a way to do this that uh, was a little bit different, which is to read the, the tree and multiple sequence alignment in step one and annotate all the branches and mutations. But then rather than store those things separately, we actually store this as a single optimized file that includes both the mutations and the tree. We call this a mutation annotated tree. Um, then what you can do in the second step is uh, load this data structure very quickly. It takes uh, you know, currently about 20 seconds for a 4 million sample tree. It can vary a little bit, but it's quick. Um, and then you can place new annotated samples onto that tree. And now, your sample placement takes about a tenth of a second. Uh, that's also out of date now. It's, it's up to about a half a second, but it's still pretty quick. Um, okay. So uh, if we add that to the table we were looking at earlier, we can see that this was orders of magnitude faster. It's a, um, I think it was about a three order of magnitude, three and a half order of magnitude speed up in how you could do this, uh, which was at the time tremendously important. And I think probably remains a really important part of how we're gonna do this stuff going forward. And um, so we were really, really happy with that. And, and now Usher is sort of the way we're doing everything in big scale phylogenetics. Um, one thing I think is really important to point out is that Usher is quite accurate. So if we measure accuracy as just the proportion of cases where I prune one sample out of the tree and then I put it back and I ask, did it have the exact same placement? That is to say, um, we're just measuring the topology here, not the mutations on each branch, but if you, those are very similar. If you measure the topology, you see that 97% yeah, of the time we get it exactly correct. Like it's, the existing sample one is the same as the user added sample. Um, this was true with both simulations where we knew the ground truth and also some comparisons we did. And so, um, you know, you may wonder why parsimony is as good as it is uh, when I think we've all been taught that maximum likelihood is the one true way to do this kind of thing. Um, and I'll talk about that in uh, the next session or two, uh, why we think parsimony is so uh, efficient for these trees. And in fact, our more recent work shows that it's probably better in many cases. Um, okay. This uh, we can skip because it's not actually that interesting. And then at the end here, I'll talk a little bit about the future of what I think this is going to look like and, um, and, and kind of some opportunities I think that are coming here. Uh, I want to emphasize that this is, um, <coughs> you know, we're in early days of figuring out how to do genomic epidemiology really, right? So it's new. It's, it's something that has existed in various sort of very academic contexts, but now what's happening is public health offices are doing this, right? So they have their own sequencers, they literally sequence uh, sick people when they, when they can, and um, they're analyzing the data. So um, there's an enormous revolution that's about to happen here over the next five to 10 years when, while public health learns to grapple with these data and learns to figure out how to work with these data at scale. And so what's, what I think is gonna happen uh, in a very, very generalized way is that a sick patient will come into a clinic um, we don't know what they have necessarily. Maybe we do, maybe it's a known virus. It, I think that will depend. There's a few different possibilities. Let's assume for now it's a known virus. Um, 
we're going to sequence that virus genome, right? It's, it's going to happen uh, literally immediately. So I'm showing you a nanopore because it is that fast. Um, you can take these things and sequence a thing. You know, these are cheap. They're less than they're a few hundred bucks. Uh, and you can actually uh, run the whole thing in hours, right? So we can, in, in maybe four or five hours, I can have a consensus genome for that virus. Uh, then we're going to take that sequence and we're going to place it on the global tree. And of course, right now, uh, you don't learn a lot. You learn that it's Delta <laughs> and you learn that it's closely related to a few other individuals, which can be really useful for certain questions in public health, but maybe not everything. But in the future, um, we're going to actually have we're already going to have important functional annotations on the tree as well, right? So what you'll know is maybe this orange mutation is particularly important for virulence, and we should treat this patient especially carefully because it might suggest there's an outbreak in our community of a particularly uh, concerning variant of this virus. So that kind of information will happen as well, right? So rather than mutation annotations, we'll have mutation annotations, but you'll also have uh, um, you know, functional annotations as well on the tree that will propagate down to my sample, and I'll say, okay, you're probably a part of this orange clade, we want, we're nervous about that clade. It has a lot going on. Um, and, and it should be almost instant, right? It'll take seconds to display this for both public health and for medicine to be able to say, okay, um, here's your answer. You should, you should worry about this particular clade or not, right? And the, and the name of the game the entire time is going to be speed. The number one thing we need to work on is, in, is inference speed, is how quickly we can go from sick person to a really actionable answer. Uh, and and um, yeah, I think that's a big opportunity we're going to face here. And I'll, I'll tell you, in future versions, uh, in, in, in you know about a week or so, um, more specifically how we're doing this, how Usher works, why it works, um, how I know it's working, and then also a little bit about uh, other possibilities in the future here as well. And um, certainly some of the really cool analysis we're gonna be able to do when we have these enormous trees. I think there's a lot of potentially fun things in there for us. Okay, so. Um, with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. I'm going to stop sharing briefly. And yeah, there's just looks like five or six minutes here at the end. So perfect. Anyway, questions? Uh, well, can you specify a bit how the tree is being constructed? And uh, the most important question, which I guess has been asked you like many times, how robust is it? Sorry, how is what? The last question there? Uh, uh, robust. Well, how, robust. <laughs> what is the degree of uncertainty depending on the data? And not like the data, but the specific order in which you acquire the data. Gotcha. Okay, so the um, next next class is the one where I'm really going to go into detail about uh, ah, yeah, okay. so, um, how, we, how we make the tree. Um, the robustness thing is a super important question, and I think the... Um, it's a really fruitful avenue of new research is uh, how we can be more, um, how we can represent uncertainty in the tree in ways more useful. I think bootstraps are uh, probably a little bit foolish for these trees and they, they don't tell us very much. People try to compute them anyway, but I think that they aren't actually the question that we're asking in most cases. And so um, we've been thinking a lot about how to represent uncertainty in more intelligible and more useful ways. And we certainly have some ideas for that as well. Yeah. Okay. So until next time. Yes, okay. until next time, basically. <laughs> Questions about what I presented today, I guess, would be the way to think about this. No. Yeah, sure. I've got no questions. Thank you for the talk. Sure, no worries. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Russ. Sure. <laughs> it was very exciting. So maybe people will think a little bit, reflect a little bit, and ask like, more questions next time. Cool. <laughs> no worries. Uh, yeah, and um, I, I may, Vladimir, is it okay if I send you guys some readings to uh, distribute for next time as well about things I'll talk about? And yeah, sure. Like, okay. yeah, it, it's really good to have some home homework. Yes, I, can, I will do that, don't worry. <laughs> I'll send you some papers now, thanks. Good, cool. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Well, uh, thanks. Yes, for everyone, please uh, keep, keep in mind that we have the change uh, in the schedule. So in a week, the lecture will be at uh, 7.15 p.m. Moscow time. Cool. Okay. Well, so... Uh,
and Russ, you will send me this uh, papers and I can distribute it all. Yep, I'll do that. No worries. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay.